is Stanton Friedman. He's the original civilian investigator of the Roswell incident. He retrieved this startling event from obscurity, making it a household name. Everybody around the world knows what Roswell is because of this gentleman. He studied physics at the University of Chicago and worked as a nuclear physicist on research and development projects for several large companies. So help me welcome Stanton Friedman. Thank you very much. I'll get my rock group in here and we'll be ready to roll. <laughs> I do want to thank Open Minds for the tremendous amount of work that went into putting on this incredible show. I still can't get over looking out the window and not finding snow, you understand. <laughs> Great arrangements, guys. <laughs> uh, the title of my talk is Exposing the UFO Debunkers. Now, if I were to be totally thorough, that would last for the next four hours. But I can't do that, so we'll pick and choose. Uh, there's a difference between a skeptic and a debunker. And unfortunately, the field has more debunkers than skeptics, I think. A skeptic says, you know, I don't know, let's study the evidence. The debunker says, I do know, there is no evidence to study. So I'll put my conclusions up front, and I'll have to give another lecture to justify those, but just so you know where I stand, I'm not an apologist ufologist, or a closet ufologist, you might have noticed that too. First, the evidence is overwhelming that planet Earth is being visited by intelligently controlled extraterrestrial spacecraft. In other words, some underlying 38 times. Some UFOs are alien spacecraft. Most are not. I don't care about them. Secondly, the subject represents a cosmic Watergate. That does not mean everybody in government knows what's going on. Most people in government have no idea what's going on. It means some few people know what's going on. And they're not talking. The third conclusion is there are no good arguments against the first two conclusions. There are people who haven't studied the relevant evidence. And finally, four, we're dealing with the biggest story of the millennium. Visits to planet Earth by alien spacecraft, successful cover-up of the best data, bodies, and wreckage for more than 60 years. It's a big story. And one of these days, we might even get the New York Times to recognize that. It will be with difficulty. So what I did in preparation here, I went through my memory files and at random picked a whole bunch of debunkers. You could call it a hall of shame, but somebody else has used that title, and so I won't do that. And if I've missed your favorite debunker, I'm sorry, uh, next time. <laughs> it, you know, debunking does require some skills a willingness to ignore the evidence, to be very flexible. If your first explanation doesn't work, try a second explanation. If that doesn't work, try a third explanation. Because we know no UFOs are alien spacecraft, right? Wrong. <laughs> uh, there's been a long history of debunkdom. I don't know what the capital city is of debunkdom. But, uh, and you know, the, the real problem is how to sort out the people who honestly believe that they're being scientific and those who are intentionally being misleading uh, and doing it out of the goodness of the heart, their hearts to protect the world against this nonsense about flying saucers. History has always had people like that. And I've had my fair share, or unfair share, I guess, of dealing with debunkers. Uh, I've done several debates. Uh, so far, I think I've won them all, but uh, a lo an Arizona person, James Magaha, may dispute that about a formal debate we had. <laughs> that was James. <laughs> uh, and you, you run across 
certain basic concepts for debunkers. The four rules, don't bother me with the facts, my mind's made up. What the public doesn't know, I'm not gonna tell them. If you can't attack the data, attack the people. And there's no point in doing investigation for research, do it by proclamation. Nobody will know the difference anyway. So it's easy to be a debunker. Uh, I reminded, and I'll show his picture, Bill Nye, the science guy. <laughs> you may have seen him on uh, Larry King with me and others. His ex-wife sent me a note saying he normally would spend at least five minutes on the internet before doing a program like that. <laughs> I'm not sure he reached his quota for the programs I did. And I've had people say, they ought to have him on more often. He looks so bad, it makes you guys look good. <laughs> we'll, we'll get to specifics about him uh, in a couple of instances anyway. So let's proceed. There are debunking claims. No aliens are visiting Earth. You know, sometimes just because if they were, they would talk to me. That's not a very good reason for saying nobody's visiting. But this is Kathleen Martin. She is not an alien. Uh, I live in Canada. I guess you could call me an alien in some kind of way. But Kathy has done the definitive work on the Betty and Barney Hill case. And if there's one case that certainly illustrates that aliens are visiting Earth, this is it. And an enormous amount of effort on her part. She did 85% of the work. They insisted my name be first. Why? It'll sell more, Stan. How do you fight that? The publisher wants to sell books. You know, strange reason, but I thought he wanted to bring the truth to the world. No, he wants to sell books. Anyway, if you want a serious discussion of alien visitation, this is the place to get it. There's Betty and Barney, and I don't mean the dog when I'm talking about aliens, incidentally. Now, in contrast, we have Dr. Susan Clancy, and if you heard uh, Kathy's talk, she's a Harvard PhD holding scientist uh, who wrote a book about people who think they've been abducted by aliens. And I'm hard pressed to find a book in which there were more false claims made. Uh, I'm sure Kathy covered most of them uh, I get a kick out of the fact that she mentions the Allagash abduction up in Maine. She says she's read everything and she's observed everything on television. You know, it's all sleep paralysis. People haven't been abducted by aliens. They, you know. uh, when she talks about Allagash, she says there were two witnesses. There were four. She says it happened in a year, 10 years away from the year in which it really happened. She said one of the two witnesses wrote the book about it. It was written by somebody else. Three out of three, all wrong. And that characterizes her comments throughout. I couldn't believe it. There's a review on my website. But it was just hard to imagine how somebody could get so much wrong, somebody who has a Harvard PhD. I mean, you know, I've often, often said uh, PhD means piled higher and deeper, and boy, this was... <laughs> A splendid example of that. And I'm being kind, frankly, you know. Uh, here's what aliens look like who picked up Betty and Barney. This is a bust done by a sculptress from data, from drawings made by somebody listening to Barney under hypnosis describe what the aliens look like. A police artist sketch, if you will. Your typical little gray guy. I haven't met any, but they're probably nice guys. The star map. Now, one thing in the book that I did dig into was the star map, and I've had more, heard more baloney about that than you can imagine. I won't go through all the details. Betty sees, I'll call it a map, I don't know whether it's a hologram or whatever. Uh, the leader says there are trade routes and occasional expeditions, and, and Betty naturally says, where are you on the map? 
wise guy alien says, do you know where you are on the map? No. I don't know anything about astronomy. How can I tell you where I'm from if you don't know where you're at? End of discussion. <laughs> it's like talking to a little kid, you know. <laughs> you don't have enough data. <laughs> anyway, the important thing is that Marjorie Fish, a brilliant woman, did something nobody else had done. She made a serious attempt at a time when it was very difficult because the astronomers had lousy data on the distances to the stars. They're not going anywhere, who cares? You want to look at a star, you need two angles, whether it's 20 light years away or 40 light years away, it doesn't matter. But if you want to build a three-dimensional model to see if you can match the two-dimensional drawing, this one, you better know distances. And they were hard to come by back in the late 60s, early 70s. And of course, Marjorie did the sensible thing. She went and talked to Betty to get as much information as she could. She didn't just sit at home and say, well, uh, I don't need to talk to the witness. We just do this on our own. Very careful, objective person. It was hard work. They wouldn't let her take the star catalogs out of the library. This is esoteric. You've got to be an accredited astronomer to get those out. Fortunately, she had help from Dr. Mitchell at Ohio State University. He's on film and UFOs are real, saying how accurate her work was. It all boils down to identifying those prominent stars. And she brought out into the light of openness, if you will, a very special pair of stars, sun-like stars. The closest to each other pair of sun-like stars in our entire local neighborhood. Now, I hate to say it, but the solar system is out in the boondocks. Uh, the next star over is 4.3 light years. These two guys, these two stars, I want to give you a sense of perspective here, are only an eighth of a light year apart. That means they're 30 times closer to each other than the sun is to the next star over. That's why I say we're out in the boondocks. These guys got next door neighbors. From I'm planted around one, looking over at the other, it's visible all day long. And you could directly observe whether there's biological life on the other planets. And oh, also, they're a billion years older than the sun. Now, I'm very conservative. Some people say they're three billion years older. But what's the difference between one and three billion? You know, they're a lot older than we are. And that has a couple of implications here. First, there'd be more incentive for interstellar travel when you got a next door neighbor. Second, because they're a billion years older, you got plenty of time to develop that technology. You remember the basic rule is that technological progress comes from doing things differently in an unpredictable way. But if you got an extra billion years on us, you're gonna know some things we don't know. I think an extra thousand years would give us some things we don't know. So they rose from obscurity to be the target of attacks from the debunkers. And I'll admit there's some pro-UFO people who suddenly picked up on Zeta Reticulans. And I think there are websites. It's funny how nobody mentioned Zeta Reticuli until after I published an article in Saga Magazine about Marjorie's work. If they knew beforehand, why didn't they tell us beforehand? It's a convenient crutch. Hey, Zeta Reticuli. That, doesn't that sound great? They're Zetans. Uh, when I was a youngster, my grandfather was Zadie. Now, I don't, there's no connection here, but <laughs> sounds close, you know. Anyway, the star map work is exciting. Uh, all the stars in the pattern are sun-like stars. They're in a plane, like thin slices of pepperoni on a big pizza, instead of like raisins in a big loaf of raisin bread. That makes it easier to travel. Nobody knew this before her work. Uh, we've got a lot better data on the distances. The Hipparcos space satellite has made millions of measurements of distances from up above the atmosphere. And uh, it's a European system, not an American system. Uh, you know, we've got to give the Europeans some credit here. And uh, it's time for somebody to redo this work with the latest data. And if there are any volunteers, talk to me later. We'll get open minds to fund a program, right? <laughs> you heard that, guys. But remember, this is down the street. Within 55 light years, there are 2,000 stars. We're not talking other galaxies. 
Andromeda is two million light years away. I don't care about Andromeda. And the way I look at things, my wife wants a loaf of bread for dinner. I don't say, I'll be back next week. There's a great bakery in Sydney, Australia. <laughs> she says, the supermarket's a mile and a half away. We need it for dinner. I'm worried about the neighborhood, not the boondocks. These are the names of the stars. The distances are slightly off. You'll notice the sun, our star, is there. Now we know it's 39.3 light years away, uh, just down the street. And there's not much behind us. And those numbers are distances in light years, Ly, and the base stars, zeta-1 and zeta-2 reticuli. And the whole point is to give you a, a sense of an entirely different situation for a civilization with next door neighbors, as opposed to distant relatives. Now, of course, the next claim is, you can't get here from there. And you know, it's amazing how many stupid things have been said by smart people about getting here from there. They, they want half an Einstein. Uh, Relativity says you can't go faster than the speed of light. See, it also says that as you get close to the speed of light, time slows down, but we don't want to talk about that. Uh, all the evidence indicates that if you're smart enough, you can get here from other stars, not using 747s. <laughs> I mean, why people want to restrict themselves to yesterday's technology instead of tomorrow's, I don't know. Now, people often invoke the Fermi paradox. This is Enrico Fermi, one of the world's greatest scientists. He was uh, unusual. He was equally at home in theory and experiment. Got a Nobel Prize in physics. Went to the United States from the Nobel Prize ceremony because coming from Italy in 1938, Mussolini was already clamping down on Jews and his wife was Jewish. They came to the United States, never went back. Now, the Fermi Paradox, it's called. There were discussions at Los Alamos. He was the architect of the atomic bomb in many ways, first nuclear chain reaction, brilliant physicist. He was one of the reasons I went to the University of Chicago. He died while I was there. It didn't have anything to do with me, but uh, I did hear him speak. And it is intriguing that he had exploratory surgery. You don't hear that phrase much anymore. He was riddled with cancer, sewed him back up. Now we use, we use nuclear techniques so that you don't have to get cut open to find out what's going on inside. That's truly amazing that you can watch the screen that tells you what's happening inside your body. Pretty neat. Impossible, somebody would have said 60 years ago, 70. Anyway, Fermi and his colleagues were talking at lunch about, you know, it really wouldn't take very long, maybe a couple million years, once you got started to colonize the entire galaxy. He, was, he, he loved back of the envelope calculations, which were usually quite right, quite accurate. And as they're leaving, suddenly Enrico says to the guy, so where is everybody? Now, there are whole books about responses. To the, see, the paradox is they should have colonized the whole galaxy. We don't seem to be seeing anybody, so where are they? Now, he was famous at Chicago. As some, I can say this as somebody who was there, for using questions to teach. You know, d the sky is blue, derive some laws of physics. It's doable, but he's got to get you thinking. And my answer to the Fermi paradox is, we don't know where they all are. We know that some of them are coming here, and the government knows a great deal about them, and they're not telling us. Now, Fermi had high-level security clearances. I don't know whether he ever got let in on what happened at Roswell or anything else about saucers. But he certainly would be the last one to say governments can't keep secrets. He knew they could. I had one guy say if saucers were coming or had crashed, there'd be an article in the Physical Review within a month. And I said, well, the nuclear, first nuclear chain reaction was uh, December 1942. No articles in the Physical Review for years and years after that. And that was an earth-shaking achievement. Anyway, there are people, and I'll show you one of them a little bit, 
that say that the Fermi paradox proves nobody's coming here. Fermi was a great physicist. He said nobody was coming here. He did not say nobody was coming here. He raised a legitimate question, so where are they? Are they hiding? Do we know about them? All kinds of other possibilities. Uh, you can't get this anymore except on the internet. <laughs> uh, Astronomy Magazine published an article and a bunch of responses, and they published this 32-page full-color booklet. I was the one who instigated the original article. Carl Sagan complained about having his name on the front. His lawyers threatened to sue them, so they made me an offer I couldn't refuse, and I wound up with 18,000 copies in my garage in California. <laughs> uh, we moved to New Brunswick, Canada. We still had many thousands. I'm out of them entirely. I could sell a bundle now. <laughs> but it was, it's a good give and take, both sides and so forth. Uh, I don't know why Carl was upset about it, but that's the way it goes. But this, I believe, is on the internet. Uh, a lot of color ink goes into printing this, incidentally. <laughs> now, one of our more prominent astronomers, he's good on television, sharp guy, Neil deGrasse Tyson. He's head of the Hayden Planetarium in New York. And on that monumental Peter Jennings mockumentary of February 24th, that was just two days ago, the anniversary, 2005, Dr. Tyson was there saying that our fastest craft, the Voyager spacecraft, would take 70,000 years to get to the nearest star, and we scientists like to get our data back a little faster than that. What he didn't say is that it's completely unpowered. It's been coasting. So it's the equivalent of saying, if I throw a bottle in the ocean, it tells me how quickly I can cross the ocean. If I fly a kite, it tells me how quickly I can fly around the planet. Don't bother me with the facts, my mind's made up. I don't know why anybody would expect astronomers to know anything about deep space travel. Generally speaking, they don't, but uh, this is a classic example of somebody smart saying something stupid. Our, our book, Science Was Wrong, has a lot of examples of that. We need to do a, another edition because there are a lot more that have come, <laughs> come around. No shortage of them. Now. It's funny how people will talk about interstellar travel as if you've got to use a chemical rocket. That's like saying you've got to do a whole bunch of calculations with your slide rule. I mentioned in front of a couple of classes that I had used a slide rule when I began work at that time, 50 years earlier. I looked around, no reaction. Anybody know what a slide rule is? Not one. <laughs> that was less than 50 years at that time. We're not tied to the past. Here's a source of energy. Man is very good when it comes to killing and developing better methods of killing. And just to show you the progression, how our minds work and where we spend our money. In World War II, a big bomb was a 10-ton blockbuster. It took a B-29 to carry that, and it made quite a mess on the ground when you dropped it. That was 1942. Five years later, or three years later, I'm sorry, our first atomic bombs, the equivalent of uh, about 17,000 tons of TNT. Well, we're not gonna stop there. In 1952, this little event took place. Our first H-bomb, first nuclear fusion device. Whether you realize it or not, fusion is the most important source of energy in all of our lives. The sun is a fusion factor. It's not a mass of burning gas. There were brilliant scientists who 110 years ago couldn't be more than 30 million years old, the sun. Eh, sun was off a little bit, it's like five billion years old. But our first fusion bomb, what you see here, the fireball was three miles wide, and it released the energy of 10 million tons of TNT. So we go from 10 to 15, 17,000, to 10 million tons. And the Russians exploded one a few years later. It was 57 million tons of TNT equivalent. That's mind-boggling. I mean, call it megatons, and it doesn't sound like it means anything. But uh, I worked on a study of fusion propulsion for deep space travel back in 1961. 
if you use the right stuff in the right way and kick particles out the back end of a rocket that have 10 million times as much energy per particle as they can get in a dumb old chemical rocket. 10 million times. So if you're gonna talk about going to the stars, don't talk about riding bicycles, which is what they seem to be doing, the debunkers. And of course, another secret, another secret, yeah. Uh, another point that's made, and I've heard it many times, especially from the SETI specialist. You all know that SETI stands for Silly Effort to Investigate. I mean, it's <laughs> S-E-T-I, it's right on. Governments can't keep secrets. Seth Shostak says, look, that's the government that runs the post office. Look how they fouled up with FEMA and Katrina. I didn't hear anything about NSA, CIA, DIA, OSI. Who cares about the post office? Well, most of us do sometimes, I guess, but uh, uh, governments can't keep secrets. Only somebody who hasn't kept secrets could make such a stupid claim. Organizations keep secrets. Uh, the first successful spy satellite in the United States, a Corona spy satellite, after 12 failures in secret, oh, we just blew up another, unfortunately, another scientific satellite, sorry. 1960, the first Corona. Got more data on Soviet military installations than all the U-2 flights that had preceded it. Were we jumping up and down and saying, look what we did? First public discussion of Corona was 1995, 35 years later. There were loads of people involved in putting up a series of spy satellites. The stealth aircraft was built at a cost of $10 billion over a 10-year period in secret. The NRO, National Reconnaissance Office, admitted uh, three years ago they'd had to cancel the program they had with Boeing to change the, the architecture of big spy satellites. They didn't get what they wanted. The NRO are the big guys on the block. Some of their spy satellites cost half a billion dollars each for the business end of that. They admitted they'd had to cancel this program. They'd only spent $14 billion. A lot of people were keeping secrets. Keeping secrets is a way of life. Do they goof sometimes? Of course they do. But you don't say a, a guy is a lousy hitter because he strikes out a lot. You pay him for the home runs he hits. Yes, sometimes secrets slip out. That doesn't mean there aren't a lot that will never slip out. I worked under security for 14 years. <laughs> this is where Bill Nye comes into the picture, incidentally. <laughs> On the Larry King show, he pulled out a document, pointed to a blacked out line, and said, these guys say that there are secrets being kept. That's nonsense. It's a guy's address. It's a privacy issue. Fortunately, I had my book with me, Flying Saucers and Science, and I was able to get to the page very quickly and hold it up for the cameras. This is what we mean by keeping secrets. It took me five years to get this top secret CIA UFO document. You can read eight words on it, and they're not exciting words. <laughs> Title, doc references, info date, USSR. Oh, there's a tough one, you know. Five years to get this. And people say, why don't you scrape off the black and see what's there? They send you a Xerox, there's nothing under the black. <laughs> they may be devious, but they're not stupid. Oh, I thought, well, we'll see later, there may be more. The NSA released uh, 156 top secret Umbra UFO documents. You can read one line per page. All the rest is sources and methods information. 95% sources and methods. And oh, it says something about a UFO and radar, but that, that doesn't count. Uh, one of the things that defines the debunkers is they ignore the data. There's no le need to look at so-called scientific studies. Says Shostak, says there is no evidence. Jill Tarter says that. And you won't find any references to any of the big studies. When I gave a lecture on the Queen Elizabeth II with Seth in the, uh, Seth in the audience, after talking about each of five large-scale studies, I asked how many people here have read this. A few had read one or another. Seth hadn't read any. 
That's par for the course. Here's two UFO evidence on the left. There's only 18% of 4,500 cases that couldn't be explained. On the right, symposium on UFOs, congressional hearings, three astronomers. It's funny, none of the astronomers ever refer to this document. Best paper by Dr. James E. McDonald from Arizona, professor. Data on 41 separate cases that could not be identified. Good cases, not lights in the sky, multiple witness radar visual sightings, for example. Sightings by pilots, by meteorologists, by astronomers. There are still people who say astronomers have never seen a UFO. Nonsense. Go to the evidence. Here's the biggest study ever done for the United States Air Force, data on 3,201 sightings. Of course, they lied about it when they put out the press release, and we'll get into that in a minute. Blue Book Special Report 14. And this comes up in several contexts. Remember, don't reference the studies if you're going to debunk it would be out of character. Dr. J. Allen Hynek was the Air Force scientific consultant for over 20 years on Project Blue Book. And uh, he wrote this book after he was no longer concerned with the Project Blue Book, which was supposedly canceled. And that was interesting. I gave him the first copy that he had of the Bolander mem memo, General Carol Bolander, Air Force, was asked in 1969 to decide what should we do with Project Blue Book. He had no previous connection with it. He published a memo, which we got years later, uh, in which he said, reports of UFOs which could affect national security are made in accordance with Joint Army-Navy Air Force Publication 146, Air Force Manual 55-11, and are not part of the Blue Book system. Air Force General. Two paragraphs later, he says, if we close Project Blue Book, the public won't have a place to report sightings to. However, as previously noted, reports which could affect national security will continue to be examined using the techniques, the regulations established for that purpose. I talked to him 10 years later. He's dead now, but, uh, and I don't know how to reach him. But, you know. <laughs> uh, there may be some people who do, but not me. And he immediately agreed when I said, you're saying there were two separate channels, reports which could affect national security over here, which didn't go to Blue Book, and the dumb, dumb stuff over here. He agreed. And that's one of the, re the problems I have with the Dr. Alexander's book, is that Bolander made it clear, two separate channels. It makes sense. Government doesn't care about stuff that doesn't affect national security, at least the Air Force doesn't. Why should they? They got enough problems otherwise. But the Air Force has been lying since 1969, actually starting long before that, but at least in this regard. We don't do anything with the UFOs. No, Project Blue Book is dead. Long live the king. You know, there are other people looking at the stuff. And they ain't talking. Uh, incidentally, the astrophysicists, the SETI cultists, they try to ignore Allen's work. I mean, he's an astronomer. He's one of them. He was chairman of the department at Northwestern University. Well-recognized authority. Wrote textbooks. We don't want to bring that up. You know, he might know something. We don't want to hear it. This is the Condon report that uh, John Alexander talks about in his book, and I tend to agree with most of what he says about it. Uh, it's interesting, they have a whole section on government involvement in UFO investigations. There isn't one mention of Blue Book Special Report 14, even though it, called, it investigated more than 20 times as many cases as Condon did. Did he know about it? Yeah, I wrote him about it and got a letter acknowledging receipt of my letter. Don't bother me with the facts, my mind's made up, and what the public doesn't know, I'm not going to tell them. The UFO subcommittee of the world's largest group of space scientists, the American Institute of Aeronautics and Astronautics, looked at the Condon report, and they wouldn't let me on the committee. I'd reached a conclusion after 11 years of study. You'd think I would, and you know. They said one could come to the opposite conclusions from Dr. Condon based on the data in the report. Any phenomena with 30% unidentified is worth investigating, and they had national conferences. 
which you didn't hear about from the New York Times, I'll guarantee you. Dear old Peter Brooksmith, an Englishman, written some books. I was involved with a debate with him at the Oxford University Debating Society. Some of the guys even had tuxedos. Nobody told me that. <laughs> they served wine before dinner, too. Uh, anyway, we went at it. It was a very well-attended debate. And they polled the people who left who were members of the debate union. We got 60% of the vote. About a month later, I get a call from Peter asking to buy some of the documents I talked about. Kind of a little late to start looking at the evidence, isn't it, after the debate? <laughs> what are you going to do? Debunkers win. There is no physical evidence. Michael Shermer says, give me a body. Why? He's not a physiologist. He doesn't have a security clearance. Why would anybody give him a body? He's a nobody. No, no, no. Come on. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, Ted Phillips has collected more than 4,000 physical trace cases from more than 80 countries. They're conspicuous by their total absence in the debunker literature. There is no physical evidence. Give me a piece of a spacecraft. Like it would have no security value. Who would care about a little piece of metal that might have incredible properties? Put it out in the public, sell pieces of it, you know, encase it in a little device. Uh, there's a lot of physical evidence. Typical example, Delphos, Kansas. There's a ring of soil there that was changed in color and texture down 14 inches. It's a long story. I've been at the site. I had analysis done of the soil. Uh, the ring soil wouldn't grow anything. Normal soil from a few feet away, the stuff on the right grows stuff fine. That's uh, normal soil on the left. I hope you notice that sophisticated soil retention device there. <laughs> I had somebody say, I can't believe anything you say when you put that paper plate up there. <laughs> well, when I was at the University of Chicago, there was a Nobel Prize winning physics experiment done, and a key piece of equipment was held up by an empty coffee can, just the right height. If they can use a coffee can, I can use a paper plate. Uh, the ring soil has a higher level of soluble minerals. The soil is too salty to grow anything, and there's no way the farmer could have done that. Now, I love the arguments that say an interstellar vehicle could not crash here. If you come here all the way from Lord knows where, you certainly wouldn't crash when you got here. And I said, well, I, I didn't say an interstellar vehicle crashed here. Well, what do you mean? You're talking about Roswell, aren't you? Sure, I'm the original civilian investigator, but I don't say that that came here from Zeta Reticuli. I say that we have a two-stage system. Between the stars, we have motherships. Uh, within the atmosphere, you have small Earth excursion modules that do their thing. When I fly on a 747, it doesn't pick me up at the back door. I got to drive to the airport, take a small commuter plane, and eventually get to the 747. And we Earthlings do exactly that. Standard technique. That is a nuclear-powered aircraft carrier. It's a big old monster. Uh, it can operate for 18 years without refueling. Think about that for a minute. It carries 75 little airplanes there that perform very well in the air, but very badly on the ocean. Just that that aircraft carrier doesn't fly very well. Two different systems. We have many reports of huge motherships, into and out of which the little disks fly. Dozens of them. Is that crazy? No, of course not. It makes perfectly good sense. The atmosphere is a very different place, and going the speed of light doesn't do you much good near the surface. One twenty-fifth of a second to fly around the planet, or seventh of a second, sorry. How do you meet somebody for lunch if you're going that fast? I mean... <laughs> if aliens were visiting, why don't they land on a White House lawn? This is one of those stupid things that gets repeated over and over again. 
Now, I hate to tell you, I know not all of you are Americans, but I'm sure you all realize the President of the United States does not speak for 6.7 billion Earthlings. There are times when he has troubles, and we're in Arizona, so I can certainly say this, when he has trouble speaking for 309 million Americans. Besides, the White House is a no-fly zone. And in 1952, there were sightings right over Washington, D.C. Radar, airplanes chasing the whole bit. It was the busiest year in Project Blue Book history. And I have a book out there, uh, Shoot Them Down, by Frank Faschino, which goes over 1952. And boy, there was a lot of activity. The largest press conference since the end of World War II in which the Air Force guy said it was temperature inversions. And all the scientists who looked at the data said, there weren't no temperature inversions. How ridiculous. But obviously the aliens aren't here to land and have tea with the president or the prime minister or anybody else like that. You say, well, why else would they come here? And there's a whole chapter in Flying Saucers and Science with reasons to come here. It's the honeymoon capital of this corner of the galaxy. Hey, there are people here on their honeymoon. I won't mention any names. Uh, you'll hear about them later. Uh, you know that the Earth is the densest planet in the solar system? I don't mean the people. That's probably true, too. But <laughs> average cubic foot of Earth weighs more than the average cubic foot of any other planet in the solar system. You say, who cares? Well, that means there are more heavy metals here. And heavy metals are rare in the universe. What's a heavy metal? You say, lead? Nah, osmium, twice the density of lead. Then there's gold and uranium and rhenium and tungsten, platinum, and they all have very special properties. You know, uranium was very popular 100 years ago. It was used to make a yellow glaze for table pottery. We didn't know it had some other properties because we didn't know there was nuclei. You know, the neutron wasn't even discovered until 1932. That's how smart we are. We're just at the beginning of becoming, quote, smart. Our behavior doesn't indicate that. Well, I mean, a primitive society whose major activity is tribal warfare. Does that sound like smart? We killed 50 million of our own kind during World War II, destroyed 1,700 cities. Does that sound like smart? Not to me it doesn't. Uh, so there are many reasons for coming here that one could think of that don't require conversation with the locals. As I've said to people, I almost never talk to the squirrels in my backyard. <laughs> Maybe some of you do, I don't know. <laughs> they do appear over big cities. This is one of a sequence of pictures taken over Salt Lake City, Utah. Uh, I stood at the exact location where the pictures were taken. There were seven of them, and a uh, good set of photographs by a good photographer. Uh, there aren't any pictures that can withstand careful examination. They're all fraudulent. Says who? My expert is Dr. Bruce McAbee, an optical physicist who's been looking at UFO pictures for decades. Worked for the United States Navy. Some pictures can withstand careful examination. The debunkers never give them careful examination. What the public doesn't know, I'm not going to tell them. Only pictures of lights in the sky, and I'll tell you, it really, uh, people want to show me their film. So I stand there and watch, nighttime, there's a light in the sky, bright light sitting there. Isn't that the greatest UFO picture you ever saw? No, <laughs> it isn't. There are some good ones, and they do withstand examination. The fact that there are crummy ones or phony ones doesn't mean there aren't good ones, because most isotopes aren't fissionable doesn't mean none are. Because most people aren't seven feet tall doesn't mean none are. The basketball coach says, don't tell me about the midgets. Give me a seven footer. But there are more midgets. I don't care. I want a seven footer. <laughs> Question of focus. Here's a picture, one of many. This is, these were only released to the public by the president of Brazil, Juscelino Kubitschek, uh, obviously a, a jokester. Santa Ana, California. Lots of analysis on these pictures. Uh, here are some rules. Well, I've said these before, but they, mar they deserve repeating. Don't bother me with the facts. My mind is made up. There's Ben Bova. 
There's a chapter in my book, uh, Flying Saucers and Science, about uh, science fiction science and UFOs. It's amazing how people you'd expect to be open-minded are so close-minded. Ben is an editor, a science fiction writer. I believe he's got a, an honorary PhD. Good guy. I had some correspondence with him, and he kept insisting that the only reason sightings can't be explained is that when there isn't enough data. I sent him a table from the Air Force, and he still comes back with the same thing, and it shows exactly the opposite. What do you have to do? Uh, drill a hole in the head to pour the data in? <laughs> now, he's not the only one. Uh, there is a chapter in here about science fiction, science, and UFOs. There's Isaac Asimov, great writer. He's written 300, 400 books. I don't know what the latest number is because they republished some of this stuff. And he said some very stupid things about UFOs. They're quoted in the book. Uh, for example, if aliens were coming here, they would either keep hidden or make contact with us, and if they do neither, they're not coming here. <laughs> You'd think he'd had a, a, a Congress with alien civilizations out there and find out what the rules of behavior are, and he knows. Utterly absurd. He made a number of other silly comments, and I quote at length, how to get permission to use the quotes you understand. Not from Isaac, he was long gone, but uh, it was disappointing. Because, I, you know, he does have a PhD. He never worked as a scientist, but uh, he, he did the work. But he didn't use it when it came to flying saucers. There's our, Dr. Arthur C. Clarke, brilliant man. Thought of the satellite a long time ago. He too has said some stupid things about flying saucers. For example, he said, look, with our current radar, we can pick up something this big up there. We haven't. And why would he have a need to know for the data obtained by the Air Defense Command? Does he expect they say, oh, we got one for you, Doc, and ship them off a report? Loads of reports from radar. It's truly mind-boggling how these guys will make pronouncements without doing any homework. Okay. Now, in the biggest study ever done, Blue Book Special Report 14, they did a quality evaluation. And you can see the results here. The best cases, the excellent ones, 35% couldn't be explained. The poorest cases, only 18%. In other words, the better the quality, the more likely to be unexplainable. And exactly as you'd expect, the better the quality, the less likely to be listed as insufficient information. Those are the facts. Biggest study ever done for the United States Air Force. Unclassified study, I better add that. Now, because of this rule, well, we'll come back to that, but bear that in mind. The better the quality, the more likely to be unexplainable. Oh. You know, don't tell the public anything. Here's a nuclear fission rocket. This is not a model. I worked on this when I worked at Westinghouse. It was this big. Power level was only 1,100 megawatts. That's half the power of Grand Coulee Dam. 1968. It worked. Oh, the program was canceled like everything else I worked on, but still. Uh, <laughs> Nuclear fission gives you more energy per pound than you can get from a dumb old chemical rocket. Uh, it was exciting to hear that they broadcast the live information from the site back to Pittsburgh where I worked. And uh, the question was how long would it last before it came apart? Uh, there was a limit of an hour on how long it could operate because they needed to cool it for after shutdown. And it ran the full hour at rated pressure and temperature. That's exciting. And I had some experiments on there, and I was worried about if something happens, I won't get any results from my experiments. It worked. It was great. But the program was canceled. Now, here's Dr. Lawrence Krauss. He was at Case Western Reserve. Now he's here in Arizona. And he had an article where he talks about, he wrote The Physics of uh, Star Trek, several other books. Brilliant guy. Except he doesn't know anything about flying saucers. He doesn't know anything about nuclear power plants. And he talked about, well, you might be able to use a nuclear power plant in space to uh, generate electricity for an ion propulsion system or something, but that'll only come about when it's okay to put nuclear power plants in space. 
He didn't seem to be aware of the fact that Russians had already launched 35 of them, giving them more power in space than the United States have. Good for uh, laser weapons, uh, big radar installations, all kinds of other goodies. None of the press mentioned any of that. They worried about, because one of them came down in northern Canada, about you might irradiate the caribou up there. Wow. Nobody said, hey, real balance in the Cold War here. Uh, he also talked about nuclear rockets, that someday the guys at NASA might get around to that. We'd already operated them. Don't bother me with the facts. Attack the people. You know, all those people are poor scientists. All those witnesses are dumb country bumpkins out there. Uh, I get a little fed up with that. They haven't gone out there, of course. They wouldn't be caught dead in Arizona or New Mexico, after all. They're not civilized out there. You know, there's a page in the New Mexico magazine, somebody forgot the 50th state. Do I need a visa to go to New Mexico? <laughs> we don't ship out of the states, ma'am. Anyway, uh, there's a lot of attacking of people. Here's Robert Schaefer, a debunker. I think if you heard Kathy talk, and I guess a lot of you did, she talked about some of the stupid things Bob has said. He got it all wrong about an offer between me and Phil Class, uh, who pays who what for doing what kind of thing. Uh, and I, one of his classics is that what the hills saw was a star-like object. They saw it next to the old man of the mountain, which is 48 feet high, an old formation which has since fallen into the local lake. But and this was at least one and a half times the size of that. That would make it 72 feet. It's just a star, a planet. They saw it go in front of the moon. You know, Jupiter does that all the time. A little side excursion flies by the moon. Mind-boggling. Well, you've heard this already. The best way to do research is by proclamation. Here's the Secretary of the Air, Air Force, Donald Quarles. Back in 1955, when Blue Book Special Report 14 was completed, they put out a press release. They didn't give the title for the report. I'm sure some newsman would have said, what do you mean 14? What happened to 1 through 13? Well, they were all classified if he'd been given an honest answer. Anyway, here's what he said. On the basis of this study, we believe no objects such as those properly described as flying saucers have overflown the United States. I feel certain that even the unknown 3% could have been explained as conventional phenomena or illusions if more complete observational data had been obtained. That's what he said. He was lying. We'll get to that in a minute. We'll have a table. Remember, 3% unknown and just because there wasn't enough data. But let me talk about national security for a minute. The SETI people say, when we get a signal, we'll proclaim it to the world. Of course, it will help their funding. Now, why anybody would care about, oh, we just heard a signal from a star 600 light years away. Big deal. If a saucer crashed two miles away, that would be a big deal. But governments can't keep secrets. We all know that. I mentioned the NSA, National Security Agency, or as popularly described, no such agency, or never says anything, NSA. This is one of 156 NSA UFO documents. And when I called them to get the new release, they said they used whiteout because Phil Klass had written them a letter saying that Friedman shows the blacked out documents and doesn't tell people its sources and methods information, which I do. Now, I think most people would laugh just as hard as this one because they used whiteout instead of blackout. <laughs> Very informative. I got 156 pages like this. Now notice up at top, if you look closely, top secret umbra. And what John Alexander was talking about was release of data that was just secret. And above that is top secret, and then there's top secret code word, umbra, ultra, magic, whatever. Usually five letter words. Well, they're not keeping a secret, Stan. I said, can you see underneath the whiteout? Well, no then they are keeping a secret. I got 156 pages like this. They're not very informative. 
Well, why would there be national security about this? Because we'd all like to build our own flying saucers. Here's one of my favorite pages, this is from the CIA. That's all it says on a page. They, I showed you one that you could read eight words on. Here they couldn't even find eight words. I guess that's Greek, uh, Latin in toto. There's Phil Klass. Now Phil, for 40 years, attacked every aspect of ufology, frequently, frequently using misrepresentation, not getting his facts right. Uh, I'll give you a specific example of that. Here's the infamous Cutler Twining memo that John talks about, John Alexander talks about in his book. Now, Phil complained about this memo. Obviously it's fraudulent because that is pica type, not elite type. And he had written the Eisenhower Library and they sent him nine examples of memos and they were all done in elite type, therefore all their stuff had to be in elite type. And he challenged me to find any other genuine memos from the National Security Council It mentions NSC on there. Uh, he'd give me $100 each for every genuine one, up to a limit of 10, unfortunately. He'd never been to the library. I'd spent weeks there. Make a long story short, I was going anyway. I brought back some, sent him copies of 14, done in the same size and style type. Sent him an invoice for $1,000. <laughs> he paid me. <laughs> I mean, here's what's ridiculous about this. The Eisenhower Library alone had 250,000 pages of National Security Council material. To say that you can go from having nine done on the same typewriter, that therefore all 250,000 pages were done on the same typewriter, is idiotic. It's typical of the intellectual bankruptcy of the pseudoscience of anti-ufology. I like the way that sounds, you know. It's sort of <laughs> You know, the funny thing is he told everybody about challenging me, but nobody about paying me. And he got very upset when I included a copy of this check in something I wrote. <laughs> Sent me a threatening letter. And I told him, Phil, I Xeroxed it, I took it to the bank, they cashed it. I can do whatever I want with the Xerox. Thank you. He shut up. Uh, this is one of the things that Bobby Schaefer got all wrong. But, I mean, it typifies, if you listen to class, he says there are no sightings without prosaic explanations, no matter what the case. And yet every large-scale scientific study gives us plenty of cases that don't have prosaic explanations. Now, at least Dr. Donald Menzel was another debunker, Harvard professor of astronomy. I didn't like the man when he was alive. I had one run-in with him called to invite him to a lecture I was giving at Harvard to uh, an engineering alumni association, because I didn't know whether it was open to the public, whether everybody on campus knew about it, or just the members, or whatever. And I gave him my name. Oh, I know all about you, he said. What? Did you see my congressional testimony next to yours? No, I've seen letters and memos. I still don't know what that means. You can't be a scientist and believe in flying saucers, he said to which my response was to laugh. He got angry. I said, look, I didn't call to argue with you. I called out of courtesy to invite you to the lecture tonight. Oh, well, of course I won't be there. So I told the story that night. Uh, so they'd know I wasn't afraid to tangle with Dr. Menz. I didn't like the man. His explanations in his books could be taken apart by a sophomore physics major at a college. And then, well, here's the typical of the things he said. All non-explained sightings are from poor observers. You notice that the data showed exactly the opposite of that. I got permission to look at his papers because his name showed up on the roster for Operation Majestic 12. And that was the first clue that this thing might, can't possibly be legitimate. How could Menzel be on this? Everybody else had a high-level security clearance. You don't need a high-level security clearance to teach astronomy at Harvard. I got permission from three different people to look at his papers at Harvard and a grant from the Fund for UFO Research and was totally shocked by what I found. I had to get permission from his wife to look at some of this stuff as well. Uh, 
There's part of the MJ-12 memo, the uh, Eisenhower briefing document. He's the third one up from the bottom. It's an all-star cast, but his name sticks out like a sore thumb, at least back in 1984 it did. I go into the documents in detail, but what I found out about Menzel was that he wrote Jack Kennedy, for example, saying that he had a longer continuous association with the National Security Agency of anybody in the country, 30 years as of 1960. When we are properly cleared to each other, I can tell you more. This is the president he's talking to, you understand. Uh, it turns out in his unpublished autobiography, he had a top secret ultra clearance with the CIA, with the FBI, with a whole bunch of industrial companies. He was a world-class cryptographer, set up classes for teaching uh, the women's part of Harvard. They were looking for people to be cryptographers and women were better at it than men. And so he set up the classes. There were all kinds of restrictions on what people could say about doing that and all that sort of thing. He was ankle deep in security. After the war, he was head of the Navy Reserve Unit in Cambridge, Mass. Uh, he belonged on this group. And half the people in ufology said, Stan, you're crazy. How could he lead a double life like that? I, Go look at the papers. Nobody did, as far as I know. Uh, I'll mention three names some of you may remember. Burgess, Philby, and McLean were Englishmen who were spies for the Soviet Union for umpteen years. They led double lives. So Menzel, I came to respect him after digging into what the facts were, because I feel you should bother with the facts. Uh, I only have a few copies of the book here, but there are more at home if anybody wants them. There's Carl Sagan. Carl and I were classmates for three years at the University of Chicago. And our last discussion was at his house a year before he died. He did more than anybody else to get people to think about extraterrestrial intelligence, and that's good. He said some awfully stupid things about UFOs, and that's bad. Uh, for example, he said, there are interesting sightings that aren't reliable. There are reliable sightings that aren't interesting. Both of those are true. But there are no interesting and reliable sightings. That is false. He never cited a reference, of course. Here's Quarles again. I feel certain even the unknown 3%. Here's the breakdown. Bottom line, the unknowns were 21.5%. That's not rounding off 3%. The next to the bottom line, they had a separate category, insufficient information. If there wasn't enough information, the sighting could not be listed as an unknown. It had to be listed as insufficient information. I wish the people who would make proclamations would look at the data. I ran across something the other day. The primary explanation for UFOs turns out to be Venus. Well, only 25% were astronomical. Ah, they're just all crackpot cases. Look at the third one up from the bottom, psychological. It was psychological aberrations. It wouldn't fit on the slide. One and a half percent. The American Physical Society, to which I and most physicists belong, says that uh, two percent of the papers submitted to it by physicists are crackpot papers. There are more crackpots involved in physics than in flying saucers. <laughs> I'm one of the few with a foot in each camp, you understand. <laughs> But you know, why would Carl go out on a limb by making such a stupid statement, totally unsupported by evidence, when the data is there? It's in my congressional testimony, for example. He was one of the people who testified as well. I think uh, Kathy told you about some of Carl's totally fa false information about the Betty and Barney Hill case in his Cosmos series. I loved the touch of having the windshield wipers working when it was a beautiful, clear night. Don't bother me with the facts. There's Michael Shermer. He's head of the Skeptic Society. He was on the Larry King show when I was on, and Governor Symington from Arizona, and a whole bunch of other people. His major contribution was interrupting other people and playing with little alien dolls. 
George Nuri was on the show, and I said to George, how about having a debate with Michael and me, because he's had Michael on. Got a PhD in history of physics, never worked as a scientist, but, so we had a debate. He started off by saying, the only reason 5% of the cases can't be explained is the residue effect. With all these crazy, strange phenomena, there's always some you don't have enough data for. I drove a truck through that with the Blue Book Special Report 14 data, with the Condon Report, and so forth. At the end of three hours, I got 80% of the vote, he got 20%. I had read two of his books and quoted from them. Of course, he hadn't read mine. Don't bother me with the facts, my mind's made up. Michael's a good example of that. Seth Shostak, nice guy. I, I, I say that seriously. Uh, you know, we're going to listen for signals until we hear from aliens out there and it's going to change everything and blah, blah, blah. Now, he admits he has a copy of my book on his nightstand. Hasn't read it, apparently. Uh, the whole business of SETI is based on crazy assumptions. That there are people out, beings out there, thinking beings out there, that are sending signals using technology appropriate for us who have only had radio for 110 years or so. What's the sense behind that? They could have had radio for a thousand years, a million years. You think they're stuck? I'm not using slide rules anymore, guys. And why would they send us a signal anyway? Did Columbus send out smoke signals to the natives before he approached? <laughs> and, you know, let's face it. If aliens are visiting, a city goes down the tubes. Who needs to listen for radio signals? Maybe you need to learn sign language as a better means of communicating. Then we have a professor, another one from Arizona. The upshot is that traditional SETI probing the skies with radio telescopes, looking for a message from the aliens, may well be a good idea, but we are doing it a few millennia too soon. <laughs> Nobody got started before we did. The only let out is if an alien present is located much closer within 50 light years. That would be amazing. But who knows? However, SETI astronomers have looked at every candidate star system out to that distance and drawn a blank. Seth will answer you. How about Zeta Reticuli? Oh, we listened. We didn't hear anything. That's the test? You're a billion years older than the sun? And they're going to use the latest in SETI technology? Our SETI technology? Makes no sense at all. Paul Davies, a great, he's written a lot of books, he's a real scholar, he's here in Arizona, he's got a, an exalted position. I love this quote. As science expands its knowledge of the universe, that means earthling science, the probability of earth-like planets out there increases every year, and thus the chance of intelligent life existing in space is at a point where it must be taken seriously by scientists. The civilizations are there or not, not what we know about them has nothing to do with it. Doesn't change a darn thing. What strange reasoning. Dr. Jill Tarter, she and her husband were flying an airplane, saw a strange light. Oh no, not a UFO. Turned out to be the moon. Well, of course, all UFO sightings are easily explained. She also said we might make contact with a star as close as a thousand light years is gonna help solve all our problems. What a conversation. Hey guys, I need some help 2,000 years later. What can we do for you? Well, I got this problem with the natives being restless. 4, 000, uh, 2,000 years later, they send you back what to do about it. Does that make any sense? Out in New Mexico for uh, Jody Foster's movie, Contact, there's Frank Drake. The Drake equation isn't really an equation because we don't know what numbers to put in. One of them, for example, is the lifespan of a civilization. What data do we have for that? Zero. <laughs> we don't know the lifespan of any civilization, certainly not our own. It could end next year, 2012, you know. <laughs> Frank is being very generous and says there might be as many as 10,000 signal sending civilizations in our galaxy. That means one in every 10 million. You gotta go a long way to find one of those guys. The latest data suggests there are more than 20 billion planets in our 
galaxy, of which, pick a number, 10%, 5%, 2%, it's a very big number, might have civilizations older than ours. It sounds great, SETI, but it really is a silly effort to investigate. Uh, there's Colonel Richard Weaver. He was the hatchet man on Roswell. Size of New York phone book. He provided the fiction about me, too, which I didn't much appreciate. Uh, Lord Martin Rees, he invoked, he said, Fermi says there's nobody coming here, and he said a lot of other dumb things over in England. He's the British Astronomer Royal. Another one said space travel is utter bilge a year before Sputnik. They have quite a tradition over there. There's Bill Nye, the science guy. He tried that fast one on the Larry King show. I was fortunate enough to be able to pull out the real document with everything blacked out. And I've really had people tell me, you ought to hope they have them on more often. It makes you look good, Stan. <laughs> He also explained away those uh, rockets going down. Well, just an electrical failure. There was triply redundant electrical power up at Malmstrom Air Force Base. He explained Roswell as a skyhook balloon, none of which were launched at that time. I tried to talk to him. That's the way it was in his mind. Here we have a lot of examples. Kathy and I each did seven chapters. Uh, there's plenty of room for another volume two and a volume three. Uh, you, there's you, one chapter on UFOs, one on abductions. Uh, let's see. Oh, here's my favorite report. It has the great explanation of crash test dummies. Uh, I thought I had a picture here. Well, we'll see. Uh, here's Dr. Joseph Nickel. He explained Roswell, just a story made up by the public relations guy. He didn't even know his name. Twelve years later, he was saying the same thing, even though I had pointed out that Walter Hout had been around a long time, was a high-class bombardier during the war. Uh, I'd known him and to suggest that he would make up a story like that for the only atomic bombing group in the entire world He'd still be serving in prison if he hadn't died a few years ago. <laughs> uh, repeated the same stupid explanation. Well, he's their scientific investigator at CSI. Uh, he's got three degrees in English and worked as a magician. <laughs> Who, well, that's sort of science, I guess you could say. Oh, there's the picture I was looking for. The one in the middle is the dummy. <laughs> I talked to the guy on the right. He's a little older now. He pointed out that all the crash test dummies were six feet tall and 175 pounds. They also had uniforms on because if they exit the airplane in a hurry, they're going to have a uniform on. Uh, how do you morph that down to somebody who's four feet tall with a big head and send them back six years in time because none were dropped until 1953? I'd like to figure out the secret of time travel. I could live a little longer, maybe, you know. That's a long way from Fredericton. Maybe I could just pop here from there, you know. Would any rancher really think that this was a strange being from outer space? I don't think so. This is the Roswell story. Oh, you can have fun trying to read that piece of paper that General Ramey was holding in his hand at Fort Worth, Texas. Dr. David Rudiak has read a lot of it. It includes phrases like victims of the wreck. Well, all balloons have victims of the wreck, don't they? <laughs> One of my favorite cartoons. I was named to the Roswell Hall of Fame uh, last year, an article in a local paper, and they had fun. It's always nice to be recognized by your peers. <laughs> Those little guys are my peers, I guess. Here's a few books. We have some at the table out front. I'll be there as soon as we're finished here. No charge for autographs. There's a free book list you can order by mail when we run out, he says optimistically. <laughs> There's a DVD. I mean, yeah, it is a big DVD. It's 168 minutes. Here's our latest book. Thanks for listening. Thank you.